We're here today at TED Med uh, 2012, and we're going to talk about fake food. Now, I know both of your backgrounds, you both have fake food in common. You come from a medical research perspective, and you come as a journalist with deep concern about the role of fake food in our society. So maybe let's start with you. From a medical and research perspective, what's fake food right. doing to us, and what is fake food? Right. Well, I talk to my uh, patients in our clinic at Boston Children's Hospital. Even five-year-olds can understand the difference. Real foods are foods that our species have, have eaten for tens of thousands of years. They grow in nature, they run around in nature. Our grandparents would have recognized them. Fake foods are um, very, an ultra-modern invention. They come from factories, uh, they're bought in packages, and they have a long list of artificial ingredients. These foods are concentrated in calories, but devoid of all nutrients. When we eat them, they absorb too rapidly, they lead to surges and crashes in blood sugar, inflammatory reactions, and oxidative stress, which is what happens when you slice an apple and it turns brown. Without the colors, the micronutrients, the phytochemicals, all of those protective factors in fruits and vegetables, our arteries and our tissues suffer the same fate as an apple when sliced and exposed to air. I mean, in the work that I do as a journalist, you know, I really focus a lot on how people are making decisions about their food. And there is a bit of a nutritional literacy problem because if folks aren't getting really solid education around, look, the basic rule is if it's a fruit or a vegetable, you should eat it, whole grains, that's really good for you. Folks do get confused. They say, oh, well, it says low fat, so that's really healthy, and I'll go for that. Obesity is expected to cost one trillion, with a T, trillion dollars per year by 2030, when today's children become adults. Now, a trillion dollars is the full difference of what is being fought over in Washington right. between the Democrats and the Republicans. With one trillion dollars extra per year, the Democrats could have social spending, the Republicans could have a balanced budget, and as Rodney King said, we could all get along. Mm -hmm. So do you think this is more about a legislative play or a cultural play or a both? Like, if we spent time, you know, you spend time in low-income communities, and a lot of what you see is sort of traditions about how people eat. If we were to spend our time changing our culture, sort of teaching our kids about healthy food, is that the faster path to sort of a less obese society, or is it really about sort of regulation? Right, that's a really good question. I get this a lot about, you know, is it culture or is it structure? And it's, it's both, right? Because culture is informed and relies on the structure that's behind it. So I think it's important to do education with folks about cooking and food access and things like that and making them, you know, sort of take their food really seriously. But also it's about making food really accessible and affordable and easy to get when it's of good quality in neighborhoods because people do go for it when they can get to it and it's easy and it's affordable. Let's not forget the importance of the family. We live in a toxic environment with adverse influences everywhere. We need to make the society a safer place for our children to live and to be healthy. Mm -hmm. But until we can, we need to use the home as a bubble of protection. The real children. home, the actual physical right. home, the actual right? Parents. Yes, yeah. actually, absolutely. The parents, we may not be able to change the school lunch program overnight, but parents can create the home as a bastion of protection. Simply put, if it doesn't support health, it doesn't come in the home. That applies to food. But that also applies to unhealthful media and advertising influences. Right. Right. That act alone can powerfully transform the health of an obese child and the whole family. How dangerous is it really? And specifically, how dangerous is it to our kids, doctor? Right. Well, it's one thing for an overweight adult at age 40 gaining an extra pound or two a year to develop type 2 diabetes by age 50 and then suffer a stroke, a heart attack, or renal failure by age 60. It's a very different thing if the clock starts ticking at age 10. Wow. And unfortunately, we're seeing this on a daily basis in our obesity clinic. Wow. Early teens with type 2 diabetes. This is an unprecedented phenomenon. So if you had one piece of advice for a parent on how to protect their kids, right. how to have them eat healthy, what's the one piece of advice? Well, um, go back to protecting the home environment. Um, while we, parents need to work together to demand our local, state, and national governments enact policies that protect parents and families and not just the food industry. The act that parents can take immediately is to create a, um, sanct uh, a sanctum in the home that allows and supports for health. Only healthful foods enter. Junk foods can be consumed outside but never enter the home.
Is that what you're seeing when you did the research for your book? If there was one kernel for parents, one piece of advice, doable advice, what would it be? Right. I mean, I think fruits and vegetables, right? I mean, we see so much about diet-related disease starting, right, with people eating a lot of processed food. And fruits and vegetables are good for all of us. That's one piece of advice that stayed the same for at least as long as I've been around. Mm -hmm. And as long as folks can sort of figure out how to get it into their house, you know, I think that's really important. I yeah. do a fair amount of reporting, right, about the lack of infrastructure in low-income neighborhoods in particular for getting good quality fresh food and that's something you know we need to have a broader conversation about you know when we're making demands on government for what we need you know we need to be thinking about healthy food the same way we think about water which yeah. is we all deserve to have it in our neighborhoods there's a common misconception that children won't eat fruits and vegetables you know that is true if they see junk food advertisements from before age one and are fed junk food in their schools and see their peers eating it but if kids weren't able to eat more complicated, interesting tastes, fruits, vegetables, the savory, umami, then our species would have died of starvation after weaning generations ago. Right. If you go to Italy, uh, Japan, or more traditional cultures in Europe, children don't have these negative influences. They grow up liking fruits and vegetables. And then as adults in Italy, we'll pay $10 for a beautiful plate of sautéed spinach with garlic and a little touch of salt. Mm, I'm hungry. Right. Yes. But one thing I'm excited about is that as people move to cities, as there's this urbanization movement, um, we live in New York and you live in Boston, and we're seeing rooftop gardens and pea patches. And I think there's going to be a great opportunity for kids to actually, in cities, grow their own vegetables, where there seems to be a real disconnection between where food is grown and where we live. That connection is decreasing. Right. I do a lot of reporting on urban agriculture. And what's really interesting to me is that it's actually strongest in low-income neighborhoods that have a, limita have a limited supermarket base, right? So folks are actually so excited about having fresh fruits and vegetables in their neighborhood, right? They're going to the trouble of actually growing it. Wow. And so you see a lot of overlap always with nutrition education, with local schools, with kids coming in. And there's also a rise in linking sort of school garden type programs with culinary and cooking education so that kids really feel involved. Right. In their food and get it. Yeah. It's really one, awesome. one of the first places to start is getting rid of the hyper sweetened influences on children today. That's not just the sugar and it's the granddaddy of all sugar sweetened beverages, but also artificial sweeteners raise cause for concern. You know, it's like coming out of a loud rock concert. You know, it's hard, into nature, it's hard to hear the sound of the birds yeah. chirping. You know, the same is true for these hyper sweetened mm -hmm. foods when children eat them all the time, they can't appreciate the sweetness of an apple, and unsweetened foods, like vegetables, seem completely unpalatable. So the first step is to tone down this ultra-sweetness, and that's something that can be done slowly and have beneficial impact throughout a child's diet. Or just leave it during Halloween. Once in a while, absolutely. Once in a while. So what, last question for you all. We're here at TEDMED, and it's really about solving big problems. You know, we're talking about major things here, cancer and obesity and Alzheimer's and aging and the impacts of that. And I'm curious, are you an optimist or pessimist about the future of health and health care in America? Tracy. Right. So for health, you know, I, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm a journalist, so my job is to be a skeptic. But I do think that people are really beginning to appreciate the importance of diet. And, you know, there are efforts around the country to bring supermarkets into low-income neighborhoods to really figure out how to partner with produce distributors to get food even into small corner stores. And so I think, you know, that's something to really celebrate and be proud of. You know, not that we couldn't do better, but I, I think we're starting to take the first steps. I think that our society's viability depends upon our addressing this epidemic of childhood obesity. And I think we will recognize that. I, see, I think that a lot of gr uh, grassroots level efforts are popping up, and it will take a while for them to coalesce into an effective political force. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, one, for your reporting, <laughs> and two, for uh, giving us tips on how to keep our kids healthy. It's been a wonderful TED Med for me, and I really appreciate your contribution. No pleasure to talk thank to you. you.